So the home equity line is great, but the reality is if somebody says, hey, you need 100 grand, we're gonna do this, even if you get excited, you then think, well, now I gotta go get a home equity line, now I have to call the bank, now they're gonna have to do an appraisal, I don't know what my house is worth, and all these roadblocks start lining up, and you just say, you know what, I just don't think it's gonna work for me, I appreciate the offer. If you have $100,000 sitting in the bank, and you know I want to use this to make a great investment, your brain will be scanning for these great investments all the time. And when somebody is having conversation about an investment, you'll step up and have that conversation. And you'll be a part of this because you know that 100 grand is earmarked to be invested. Welcome back to another episode of Wealth Wednesday. I'm Nate Crannell. If you don't know, I'm the host of the Doctors and Dollars podcast. I'm joined today again by Mike Neubauer, CEO of Grand Vision Companies. We partner together with physicians across the country to execute advanced wealth building and tax strategies to help them create their ideal life. Part of that is getting financing for their home. Mike, you've been, along with uh, Grand Vision Companies, have been a mortgage broker since 2010, I believe it is, uh, ha have issued millions of dollars worth of loans. I think you're the perfect person to talk to as it relates to financing for that primary home for physicians. Specifically today, I want to talk about physician mortgages, uh, physician home loans. There's a lot of banks out there that offer these. There's a lot of pros, there's some cons, but I wanna make sure that we're educating physicians on the pros and, and what they should be looking for as they're considering this. Today though, I'm gonna take a different angle with you. I wanna talk about it as if I'm a doctor. So look at me today as if I'm Dr. Nate Crannell, uh, and, and I just have some questions and I want you to educate me and, and help me understand why a physician home loan uh, might be the best avenue for me to go. Does that sound fair? All right, man, let's do it. Awesome. So uh, I'm a physician. I've been doing a bunch of bunch of homework. I'm looking for like that next million dollar house that I wanna move my family into. One of the things that I heard about physician home loans that is great uh, is very low or zero down payment that comes with that loan. Wh why would that be important to me? Um, so, I mean, the less money you got to put down, the better, because it gives you flexibility. You can always put down more if you choose, if you want to go that route, but it's nice to have that flexibility put down as little as you want. The biggest benefit is, A, you may not have a lot of money in the bank if you just graduated, you're just becoming an attending, you haven't had time to build up that down payment, so you just might not have it available. B, you might want to start your investing career, so have that money available to start putting into other things versus lumping it all into your um, house. C, you might just be the type of person that likes to have cash in the bank. You feel real secure having that cash in the bank. So you want to keep some money on the side to say, in case something happens, in case I don't like the first place that I go for this job, in case I decide to switch you know, and go to a different city to do this, I want to know that I have some wiggle room here with money in the bank. So those are kind of be the three reasons that you may want to just keep that cash on the side instead of putting everything you have towards a down payment. What's, what's the traditional down payment? If you're thinking Fannie, Freddie, uh, FHA, I heard could be good. Like what's the typical down payment there? Like how much money am I saving by going with a, a low or zero down payment with a physician loan versus the, the traditional financing options? Yeah. So, I mean, nowadays you're going to find the, uh, the ability to go almost 0% to 20% and any range in between. So even Fannie and Freddie are going to be pushing down into the 5% if you wanted to be, you know, the FHA is going to be below 5% as well. You may be a veteran and have VA, which would be a 0%. If you buy in the country, be USDA loan. So there's a lot of different options. The physician loan, the nice thing is that it's going to be more uh, individualized. So you're going to talk to a bank, and although the bank offers this physician loan, they don't have a set, you know, rubric of requirements that you have to exactly meet this. That's going to be more of an individual conversation with the bank, where they have flexibility to bend the rules a little bit because it's their rules, where those other loans are all federal rules, so the bank has no wiggle room. You have to meet the underwriting guidelines or you don't qualify. And the nice thing of the physician loan is they can look at everything on an individualized basis and say, we can do 0%, but we'll charge a little bit more on the rate. Or you can say, what if I did 5%? And they have that flexibility to kind of make it more an individualized deal for you. Gotcha. So you're saying it's, it's important for me to go out as I'm, I'm getting this loan important to have a good relationship with my bank? So every bank that offers a physician loan is going to have a slight variation of how they do it. They're all going to be very similar. 
but the reality is that's a uh, conversation with a one-on-one -on -one bank where an FHA, a Franny, or a Fannie Mae, a Freddie Mac, these loans are done by banks, but they're immediately sold off to the secondary market. So the bank is really just the front of it. They're not the ones actually lending the money. Where on the physician loan side of things, they're really loaning the money. Now they may sell it down the road, but in general, it's actually their money that's going out right now. So because of that, they're gonna be that individualized approach and you need to kind of work with multiple ones to see where it really fits what you're looking for. So it's not gonna be the same across the board. You're not gonna just pick one bank. You're gonna to talk to a few different ones, explain the situation, especially if they already offer a physician loan and say, walk me through what your requirements are and then what the benefits are. And then you can compare each bank to see what best fits your situation. So the other ones, Fannie, Freddie, that's gonna be all the same. All it's gonna come down to is down payment and interest rate, but every single lender has the same ability to match a different lender because it all meets, say, FHA or uh, conventional guidelines. That makes sense. So uh, I've been a doctor for 10 years. Again, we're talking hypothetical. Uh, I'm not smart enough to be a doctor like all our listeners, but uh, I I've been a doctor for 10 years. I just landed a new job in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I got to move there in in a couple months. Uh, one of the things that I heard great about physician home loans is that there's a faster closing rate. Like I have the ability to close in less than 90 days uh, because my new job is coming up. What would be the benefit of that versus, let's say, going and renting for a couple months? Uh, I mean, really, it just comes down to the fact that renting a few months is going to be expensive and be difficult. You know, I mean, you're probably nowadays going to be more of an Airbnb type situation or just stay in a hotel for a few months. Um, you're not going to find really a regular landlord and want to go furnish a rental house or something and then have to move right back out in a couple of months. That's kind of a pain. So, I mean, really that's the biggest benefit is that when you find a deal, you can execute on it quickly, but more importantly, the benefit of closing soon is that you can have a stronger offer to the seller. So if the bank says, Hey, we can close this in 25 days, our appraisals come back within a week, we can be ready to go in 25 days you can make that offer very strong to the seller. So if the seller's in a situation where they want to get on and move and get out of this house, you don't have to say it's gonna take 60 days, you can get it done sooner and then maybe you can get a better deal on the house because that's attractive to the seller. Gotcha, yeah, I didn't even think about it that way, I guess. I, I was just thinking the financing side, but the actual real estate transaction itself, that can be advantage for me to say, hey, I'm, I'm coming with financing from a physician loan uh, that puts me in a better position versus maybe some other potential buyers. So just like the down payment, the nice thing is if you can do a zero down, you can still do 20% or 40% down if you really wanted to. Same thing with being able to close sooner. The nice thing with being able to close sooner is you have the flexibility if it's beneficial to you, but you can also just talk to the bank and say, I really don't want to close that quickly. I'm looking to close around this date. And then you can kind of pick that date in the future. It could be 45 days, 60 days, however that works out. But it's always nice to have the best case scenario and then the flexibility to do whatever you want. Gotcha. No, that would be a big advantage. I mean, if I can improve the real estate transaction just based on the type of loan that I'm getting, I like being able to position myself ahead of others or be more attractive um, from a buyer standpoint. Than, than other folks. Um, I think the biggest thing I think about and where I've, you know, again, I've, I've been a doctor for 10 years, again, hypothetically, but uh, I got this student debt loan, uh, you know, just, just sitting over me, another $200,000 of, of student loan debt just sitting there. Uh, I heard that that's not counted, you know, when, when they're doing the underwriting of these loans. A couple questions there, like, why don't they count it? And then them not counting it, you know, making that decision as part of the underwriting process. How does that benefit me for them not putting that on my balance sheet as they're doing the underwriting of that loan. Yeah, so not that they're not counting it, they're taking it into consideration, but they don't have the federal guidelines that specify this is the exact debt to income that you have to meet in order to qualify. So because you're working with the bank individually, they can be flexible on the debt to income. Now, when they underwrite it in-house and make a decision, they're still considering whether you can actually service this loan or you make you have to pay too much in loans already, so you can never qualify for this mortgage. That consideration is there. It's just not a hard and fast rule. At the end of the day, the reality is that uh, FHA, Fannie, Freddie, they have to be available for all Americans. So the rules have to be something that's fair for all Americans, and they can't say, okay, but if you're a doctor or an attorney or somebody who's going to make a lot of money in the future, we're gonna take that into consideration because then all Americans would say, well, I'm gonna get a good job in the future. Why can't I have that loan? So Fannie, Freddie, all of these ones have to keep it fair across the board. 
The difference is that the bank is able to say, okay, we realize that physicians will make a lot more money in the future than they make today. We also realize from the data that we can pull is that physicians rarely default on their loans. So very little risk, very high likelihood that the return is gonna come through. Also high likelihood that the physician is going to borrow in the future. They're gonna buy another property. They're gonna finance vehicles. They're gonna take out credit cards, maybe refinance student loans a million different options. So the bank is saying, we can get a very safe borrower, we can build a relationship with this safe borrower and potentially have access to lending money to this person in the future. So they're looking at it, what is the benefit to us? And then because of that benefit that we get access to, we will be flexible on our side on how we put these loans together. One of those things being that they'll be flexible on student loans and they realize that there's some alternative options to lower student loan amounts until you're making enough money to pay them. They realize that even if your debt to income is very high today, next year you, be, you may be making 400,000 more per year and now the debt to income is gonna be great. So they realize all these considerations and then they have the in-house underwriter that's gonna be able to make an individualized decision on that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I can see it from their side of the table uh, why I would be an attractive client to have within their bank. I still look at it from my side of the table. Like if they're able to give me favorable rates, favorable, uh, terms on other financing, like why wouldn't I? They gave me a great physician loan that puts me in a great position for you know, future investing by not having to put as much down, gets me into my house sooner you know, because I was able to close faster. Like all of those favorabilities to me uh, means I'm gonna go right back to that bank if I do wanna get a new car or you know, open up a, a, a savings account for my kids. Like why wouldn't I go back to that bank? That's the nice thing is that really it is a win-win. It's just a subclass of American citizens that happen to be very low risk on the credit side of things. They make a lot of money. Therefore, there's just some side benefits that come with having a career like that. And the banks realize that. So it's able to have a win-win kind of option there for them. So, um, and I mean, not to say that the physician loan is always the best route. I know we're talking about the physician loan and really kind of focusing on the benefits, but the Fannie, the Freddie, those options, if you're a VA uh, loan, um, if you qualify for a VA loan because you're a veteran, I mean, all these different loan options may be the better use, but the physician loan is something that's many times just misunderstood because it's an individualized approach. So you can't just Google it and find the answer for every lender out there on what the debt to income is or what the down payment requirement is. Um, so they have a lot more flexibility really is what it comes down to. Yeah, definitely. I don't want to say a unique circumstance because it's not like there's only one doctor in the country, right? There's hundreds of thousands of doctors, but like to just have one industry have its own loan type um, is unique. Um, but again, physicians from an income standpoint uh, and just a lifestyle standpoint are, are kind of different than a lot of folks. So it makes sense. Uh, you mentioned one thing about rates earlier. Uh, I know one of the cons of, of a physician loan can be the rate can be a little higher, right? Maybe a traditional loan, I can get six and a half percent. But you know, if, if I go with the physician home loan, maybe it's 6.8%, you know, I'm, I'm paying a little bit more. Doesn't change my down payment a lot, but one thing I did here was that uh, no private mortgage insurance, PMI. I mean, what what is PMI for one? Because I'm not quite sure, but also two, uh, how does not having PMI, how does that impact my monthly payment? How much am I saving, you know, over the life of a 30 year loan by not having PMI? Yeah, so PMI is just private mortgage insurance, or you'd have uh, mortgage, mortgage insurance on an FHA loan. It basically says that the bank wants 20% down in general, and that's enough security that if the bank has to take this house back from you and foreclose on it, they can sell it and still get the balance back because you put 20% down, they really only need to get 80 cents on the dollar for the sale of that home to cover their loan. So it reduces the risk for them. If you put down less than 20%, there's now an increased risk. So they have to figure out a way, how do we remove that risk? That is where a mortgage insurance company comes in. Basically, you pay a premium to a mortgage insurance company, and then the mortgage insurance is meant to be there that if the bank has to take this house back and foreclose on you, let's say you had 10% down and 10% um, was an extra carry by the bank. So they lended 90% now. They don't want that extra 10% of risk so the mortgage insurance is able to step in and in the case of foreclosure, cover that loss for the bank so that they don't have that catastrophic loss. Um, whether it works or not, you know, on the side, the back end of things during the 08 housing crisis, there's a huge issue because mortgage insurance companies were going under. But in a perfect world, that's how the process works is the mortgage insurance 
covers the loss for the bank in case they have to take that house back and take a loss on the house. These physician loan companies, are they are they incentivizing doctors to use this loan type by saying no private mortgage insurance because it's, it's, it's just kind of the carrot out in front to come? Or to me, like I'm, I'm a doctor, I pay all my bills on time, I make good income. Like I have no, I, I'm very strong in the belief that I'm never going to miss any of my payments. So like for me to have to put down or, or pay for mortgage insurance just seems crazy because like I'm never going to miss payments. You're never going to have to foreclose on me. Is that the incentives? They just understand that the doctors are wired a certain way that they're just not going to miss their payments. They're making good income. So why have mortgage insurance sitting out there as a potential opportunity or what? what's the incentive for the bank to, to offer that? Uh, yes and no. So you're, you are right. The bank feels more comfortable, so they're willing to do that. But it comes back to the fact that the mortgage insurance is really there so that every American is on the same playing field. Because when you go get it, so let's say if you're a doctor, you go get a loan and then the contractor, the plumber down the street goes and gets a loan. You each want to put down 10% instead of 20. Well, the reality is the bank is not funding that money. They're going to give you the loan and then immediately sell it off in a package with millions of other Americans who took out loans. So in order to put that loan in that package, when the pension fund or the Fed or whoever buys this huge package of loans, when they buy it, they want to know every loan meets these exact requirements. So if you put down less than 20 percent, they don't want to go through all these different loans to see, did somebody not pay mortgage insurance? Did this person pay it? They want to know that every box has been checked. And when they buy this huge multi-billion package of loans, everybody meets the exact same standard. So they can't have those carve outs for physicians because then it would make that a complicated process and it's meant to move big volumes of loans. And the only way to do that is to have everybody be on the exact same playing field and they want the protection that the mortgage insurance is there. So really that's what the reason is, is that the bank, when you're dealing with them, they're not trying to package you and lump you into the same standards that the plumber does and the baker and the attorney and everybody else. They're able to say, okay, let's look at your individualized situation and see if mortgage insurance is necessary and if it would be a benefit to us to require it based on the fact that we might lose this uh, borrower if we require it. So they're actually weighing these options on an individualized basis not on every single American having the exact same loan program. Gotcha. That makes sense. I mean, you did a great job explaining today I, uh, the mortgage loans uh, for physicians, specifically for physicians. We got zero down payment, uh, faster closing, unaccounted student loan debt, and then no private mortgage insurance. I think those are, those are big pros uh, to this type of program. But you got me thinking, though, you mentioned them earlier. Uh, I don't want to talk about Fannie and Freddie. Those are more of the traditional um, lending agencies. But you mentioned VA uh, and FHA and even USDA. Some of those, I guess I would call them alternatives, right? So I know, um, you know, that there's a lot of doctors who, who served in the military. I know there's a lot of doctors who maybe want to go buy an acreage outside of town. Uh, talk to me about some of the benefits of, of those different um, the kind of the alternatives that may be more attractive for a physician. So let's, uh, let's start with VA loans. What are some of the big highlights of VA loans? You know, let's say I'm a former military, uh, participant and, and now I'm a doctor, you know, uh, privately, what are some of my advantages there that may outweigh what a, uh, a physician home loan would offer? Uh, so the biggest advantage of a VA is going to be 0% down. That's by far always going to be the best um, advantage, and you have to just be a veteran to qualify for it. So they're also going to have usually very good rates. At minimum, they're going to be comparable with the other programs that are out there because there's a guarantee. So when the bank does this loan and these loans get packaged, the United States government has a guarantee that gives the protection to that lender as well, and it encourages lenders to make these types of loans. So because that protection is there already, banks will push those loans and the rates to be as competitive as possible. The USDA is a very similar program. It's just not for veterans. It's for people that are gonna be buying in rural areas. So the USDA is meant to stabilize rural areas. And a, one way to do that, to help housing out there, is to offer a great loan program that only qualifies in these different areas. So the USDA is gonna be based on population of an area, and then they have a map that charts out the exact boundaries of what qualifies and what doesn't. But if you're in a rural community, then typically you'd qualify for that. 
both the VA and the USDA, the only thing would be that they do have caps on the amount of money that they will lend. So you can't go buy a multi-million yeah. dollar house and use one of these programs because they do have caps where the physician loan is not going to have that cap by default. Um, the other thing is the USDA and the VA, they're, they're not going to be individualized. Their segment is going to be just veterans. So it's going to not say, well, you're a veteran physician or you're a veteran attorney. It's all vets. So that's the subset where the other ones we talked about were all Americans. This subset is veterans. So you have to fall within that parameter and that's how they base it. Same with the USDA. It's only for people that are buying in the rural areas. So it's a little bit more individualized, but this is kind of your group now that you have to qualify with as far as parameters, where the physician loan is much more of that individualized approach still. So VA and USDA, they likely would have better rates, but they're gonna have some limitations for them as well, you know, compared to the physician loan. Right, I know, I know more, most traditional mortgages, uh, the, the max that you can lend, that they'll lend out is like $766,000. If I'm looking for a million dollar house, 1.2, something like that, I'm kind of limited on on my mortgage options. Is that the same for FHA then as well? I know that uh, they have lower down payments. Um, you know, I'm making half million dollars a year as a physician. I want to buy a $1.2 million house. Am I eligible to get an FHA loan? Yeah, FHA will have limits on the purchase um, price as well. FHA is really going to be more for it's kind of the backstop when you don't qualify for any of these other loan programs. FHA is there so people can still buy houses even though they don't qualify for these other programs. So it's gonna have a lower down payment. It's gonna have a different mortgage insurance premium type setup versus conventional. Um, but in general, the FHA is gonna be more of a last resort compared to these other options. So if you qualify for a physician, Fannie, Freddie, USDA, VA, you're really gonna be looking at those options first and foremost, an FHA will be kind of a backup, likely would not be used, but it is, it is a fine option to use and it's an easy one to price. If you're getting loan rates and costs, it's very easy to say, what would this be you know, if I did FHA? So you can compare them very quickly. Gotcha. All right, I'm gonna take off my physician hat. I am way underqualified uh, to even pretend to be a physician when talking about financing. So I'll, I'll go back to regular Nate Crannell, but give me some thoughts on uh, comparing banks. I know when you're thinking about financing, I mean, we talked earlier about having a good relationship with your bank. Um, what are some of your thoughts around, you know, a, a huge institutional lender like a Chase or a Wells Fargo versus maybe your hometown bank versus maybe a credit union? What are some of the advantages for a physician going into any of those three stops, uh, you know, when it comes to a banking relationship? So most of the big banks are not going to be offering these individual type loans. They would rather that a small bank gives you the loan and then the big bank like Chase or Wells Fargo, they will fund the loan to that local bank and then the local bank goes to you. That's really how they would prefer to do it. They don't want to get tied up into these small little type of deals because they're just trying to move way too big of sums of money to worry about individualized. So you're just not going to find these types of options at Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, stuff like that. If you do find them, they're not gonna be flexible. It's gonna be just a set standard. Hey, you either qualify or you don't. They're not gonna be the most competitive option because they're really just not built for that type of lending. Uh, credit unions may have some of these options. Credit unions are great. You're very likely gonna have the best rates at a credit union. Not always, but they have a lot more flexibility in that. The downside of a credit union is similar. They usually will have their program set in place and because it's actually run by the members and everybody's a member of that credit union, they can't really be flexible and say, well, for you, we'll give you this deal, but for you, we have to do it like this because it's supposed to be fair for all of their members. So they could say fair for all of our physician members and there's probably credit unions that are only for physicians, but they have to keep pretty set standards. So the nice thing is you know exactly how it works. The downside is you lose some flexibility. The local banks are gonna be likely the best option for flexibility. They're not going to have a set standard and program that you always have to qualify. So you're going to be able to kind of work one on one. The downside is when you have that flexibility, if you're not well versed in finance, you can get taken advantage of in those conversations. And I don't want to say like a scam or, you know, somebody really. But if you don't understand the financing and really know how to create a win win where the bank says, OK, this is safe for us. We're going to give up a little bit here, but we made it safer like this. You're going to just get whatever's in the bank's best interest. And they're going to say, we could do this loan like this. And you're going to say yes or no. That's where the, 
the tough part of having flexibility is, is it puts a lot of responsibility back on you then to navigate that conversation. So some things, for example, would be the bank may say, we're gonna be around this rate. Let's say uh, six to six and a quarter is roughly where we're gonna be. Well, one thing to get closer to that six, you may say, well, what if I move my savings account from this bank to you and I park $100,000 at your bank? Would that help me get closer to 6% instead of six and a quarter? And you're gonna start kind of feeling out what is the bank looking for as far as the benefit that you can give for almost nothing. It's a free give to them, but it's very helpful. And then on the flip side, they're gonna give something back in return. You may say, I start my new job in four months, so I would like to lock the rate in today, but I can't close for four months. Or I know I'm gonna get this raise in four months, so could I do interest only payments for the first six months and then switch to a full payment after I get this new job in four months? So you have a lot of those type of flexible options that don't make a big difference to the bank, as long as you're able to give something in return to them that does help their balance sheet. So that's where that flexibility really is. Uh, it's nice to have those conversations, but if that language is above you, you can really kind of lose track of where you're at and uh, make a mistake there, so. I am super excited to introduce to you the Doctors and Dollars five-day financial challenge. I'm Mike Neubauer, I'm CEO of Grand Vision Companies, and I'm the one that you see on the Wealth Wednesday and Daily Dollar episodes with Nate. So Nate and I are partnering again to do something even more exciting, which is the five-day challenge. We're taking the best of all of our episodes, all of our expertise and knowledge, and we're condensing it into an impactful and purposeful five-day presentation, one hour per day, for five days, to give you everything you need to build that foundation for your financial future. So if you're looking to gain the pieces, you want those puzzle pieces and find out how they fit in your financial plan, head over to the Doctors and Dollars website, join us on the five-day challenge. We're putting it together for free, so you got nothing to lose. We look forward to seeing you on the inside. Other than listening to this podcast, where might a physician learn some of those nuances? Uh, the interest-only loans, the simply moving a savings account from one to the other, which you're right, free to you. I mean, most savings accounts don't cost anything, uh, but for the bank, that's $100,000 of deposits that that they didn't have before uh, that makes their balance sheet look better. Where where can you learn or where did you learn some of those nuances? I mean, man, that's tough to say to just learn. That, that's one of the things where you learn it, but to make it actually helpful, it has to be applied knowledge. So having the knowledge is one thing, actually sitting in those conversations and applying that knowledge is when it really sets in and you start to actually have the actual learning process there. Um, so I think really I would learn, I would research some of these different topics. I don't know, leave a comment, we'll try to answer it. Um, but this is like in the family office why we tell, you know, when somebody's going to buy a property and we'll say, go talk to the bank, build that relationship, but then tell them, hey, I have an advisor that I just like to run everything by. Would you mind talking to him on the phone real quick so he can kind of make sure I'm doing everything correctly? You know, and that's really because you just don't get enough at bats to become good at it. That's why, you know, we're good at it. We've just done it so many times. You know, when we're buying apartment complexes, whether we're buying houses, storage facilities, those conversations with the bank is where you start to build that muscle and start to realize, okay, this is what the bank really likes. They could use more of this. If I can find a way to give them that, then I can get a little bit more pushy over here. The downside as well is if you do this, let's say this year, in five years, what the bank needs may have changed. So it's something you have to keep build, you have to build that muscle, but then you have to keep it active because in five years, the bank may say, we don't need $100,000 in deposits anymore because that's not where the economy is. What we actually need is X, Y, Z. So you have to kind of stay in the game to know where is my leverage in this conversation nowadays versus where it was years ago. What helps you move the needle to get me, so it's advantageous for me to do a loan with you versus you, know, you to do a loan with me or like provide me the lending. You know, is it okay to have those conversations? Is that kind of the at-bats you're talking about? Or is it, I mean, rely on folks like you and I to, to kind of have those conversations with them? In a perfect world, you would have both. You would have you and I to right. advise and guide somebody. And then you would also go practice those. And then you would come back and say, hey, here's what they said. What do they mean by this? And then now you kind of gain that next level. So in a perfect world, you have both. If you don't have us, then yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You go and you have these conversations. You line up the conversations with multiple banks. There's gonna be people that you connect better with and ones that you don't. The ones that you connect better with that feel pretty easy to talk to, then you will just say that. You say, ah, oh, man, I was hoping that rate would be a little bit lower. I know that that's kind of where they're at. 
is there anything we could do to make this a little bit easier for me? Is there, could I come with a little bit less of a down payment? Or do you guys do interest only options ever? Would that work? And you're looking to see where the bank is gonna say, yeah, we could consider that. And now you know, okay, that's what they're looking for. Or you just kind of have that conversation in the reverse and you say, I know I qualify for the physician loan. I know I meet most of the parameters. Is there anything I could do in addition to this to really kind of make this a better scenario where I could get a little bit better rate or I could get some flexibility. If I move some money over here or if I did something else, had my HSA held at your account, is there anything I could do on my side to kind of make it a little bit easier to get this loan done into the finish line? And they'll respond and they'll tell you things. They'll either say, no, you know, we, we have to go with these parameters. That's probably more of a credit union approach where they're gonna say, I just, I don't have the flexibility to do that. Or they're going to say, well, you know, moving an account over here would be helpful. We do like having our borrower's accounts at our office. And now you start to kind of pick up on what, what works and what doesn't. And then you go to another bank and you have that same conversation. And you'll start to see the congruency of, okay, all of these banks get excited when I talk about moving $100,000 from a savings account over here. All of these banks, when I said, would you consider interest only or would you consider a lower down payment? They, none of them were willing to do interest only, but they all said yes to the lower down payment or vice versa. None of them would do less down payment, but they did say they do an, a year of interest only. So you start to kind of see the commonalities and that's why you really have to have the at-bats on a regular basis because those commonalities are based on what the economy is doing. So when you have these conversations with the different lenders on a regular basis, you're able to start to see those trends change where all of a sudden the bank is more excited about this instead of what they were excited about three years ago. Um, but for right now, you're just looking to buy one house, just do a physician loan, and you say, I want the absolute best deal that I can. I don't have Mike and Nate to call and ask these questions to. The best thing you do, set up appointments with five different lenders that do physician loans, walk in there and just have a conversation with them and take notes and see what is going to be a commonality here that everybody does. And there may be one lender that their program is just the best by itself and you know that's where you're gonna go. So then you're still gaining the at-bats by talking to other banks, but through these conversations with these five, one may jump off the paper and you may say, well, that is clearly the best option already. So I'm gonna be going to this bank anyways. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, and we said it earlier, like that just to have a good, strong relationship with your bank. And even if the, the, the first step is, is getting a mortgage with them, which then leads to, you know, auto financing and savings accounts for kids and HSAs and all the other things, you know, there could be favorable terms that, that lean more in your favor and less in the banks down the road. You know, if you're having those conversations up front with a large type of loan, like a mortgage, you know, you're more, you're more apt to get some of those more favorable conditions later down the road by having a strong relationship with your lender. So I think that's, that's really good advice. Um, I think one thing that I want to touch on before we wrap up, and it's, it's probably the biggest thing that, most physicians think about, you know, as they're thinking about going to get a new home, the most important thing to them is that what is my monthly payment and what is my interest rate? Most of them think what's my monthly payment. I'm just trying to keep that number as low as possible so that I have discretionary income elsewhere. Uh, and really they want to lower interest rate because they want to be able to tell their colleagues or their neighbor down the street, like, ah, yeah, here's the rate I got. And they want to be better than the other one. Right. And so I want to talk about what is the importance of you know, even a quarter percent, a half a percent lower interest rate over the life of a 30 year loan. Think about like the amortization of that loan over 30 years. How important is a quarter percent or half a percent difference in that rate and why physicians should be, even if it's just a, you know, puffing out their chest type of thing, why is it important financially for them to, to get a lower rate as best they can? So I think honestly, most people focus on the rate and they get tunnel vision and they miss the big picture. So a quarter percent, a half percent, over 30 years when you type into a calculator, it does make a big difference. So that's true on an Excel sheet. But the reality is very rarely does somebody, especially nowadays, stay in that original home for 30 years. So you're using 30 year numbers to make a decision when the truth is that most people will move within the first 10 years. So you really should be focused on the first 10, knowing that statistically most people don't stay in the home 30 years anymore. To me, I think, and you have to be good at this, you can't go buy a yacht, um, don't even call it a yacht, call it something more simple. You can't go buy a $100,000 camper because you saved your down payment. 
But if you can negotiate and put less money down without much consequence, and maybe you have to pay a slightly higher rate so that you can get your investing journey to start buying your time back sooner, I think that would typically be a better option. That's not a blanket statement across the board because sometimes like you look right now and rates are likely gonna start coming back down. We don't know how low they'll go, but they're gonna come down a little bit. So it is dependent on the situation where if rates are about to go up and you see that coming, maybe you wanna lock in the lowest and best rate because you know that's coming. But for me, I like the flexibility of having cash to be able to invest. You do have to have the uh, discipline with that cash though to properly put it somewhere. You have to actually invest it. You cannot take it somewhere else and blow it and, on a depreciating asset. And a lot of this comes to everybody's individualized situation. And that's why the internet is so brutal because you can Google and find these answers and get a general understanding, but it's not an individualized look at your situation to see, here's how much we have in student loans. Here's what my investing willingness is, I want to go actively invest, or I don't want to actively invest at all. I want everything to be passive. Um, I plan to work for 20 years. I plan to have a big family. I plan to retire in 10 years. I plan to teach and back out of practicing in 20 years. Everybody has this individualized approach or a vision for their life, which means the loan is going to, has to be built for that individualized person. So it's tough to give these answers, but the truth is, a quarter or a half percent, it can on a chart and a calculator seem to make a big difference. But for your individualized situation, it may be less of a difference. You may plan to turn this into a rental in a couple of years. You may plan to sell this in five years and move somewhere else. All those considerations need to be taken into account because it may sometimes be better to pay a little bit higher rate and keep more money in your pocket or get interest only payments for a while, whatever the case may be, to negotiate some part of that where a higher rate is actually more beneficial to you. So that's a kind of a soapbox, you know, I know, but that is something that just drives me nuts is people will focus and they'll just compare that 30 year amortization, or they'll say, I took out a 15 year loan because look at all the interest I'm saving. And the reality is you're gonna sell that house and move in seven years. So the 15 and 30 year do not make a big difference. It just raises the amount of money you're paying today. It has to be an actual individualized, put it all on the table. Let's look at the financial statement, the income statement, and the life vision to say, what does the next five to 10 years look like? So we can make this financial decision based on this future plan for your life. Sure, that is great insight because I think a lot of people go out there and they, they hunt uh, for that lower rate but it is at the detriment of the, maybe the, the overall lifestyle. You know, if they will, you know, look holistically at their wealth plan, it's at the detriment of that, right? They may want to get into investing. They may have an opportunity that comes up in a couple of years where someone has a great business idea. There's a great investment opportunity where cash is needed. And I'm like, man, I just don't have it because I put so much down uh, to get that lower rate. When to your point, they may not even be in that house five years from now. Uh, they just don't know. And that's, that's one of the things that we talk about in our in our doctors and dollars, you know, five day financial challenge is like buying back your time, being able to position and invest wisely to get buy back your time so that you can maintain a lifestyle that you want to. I mean, if you're throwing one hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars down on a down payment of a house today and to your point, not even being there five, seven, ten years from now, you, that's at a detriment to what lifestyle it is that you want to live. And so making financial choices where you're thinking not 30 years down the road, uh, like the mortgage and, and all that contract says, but thinking two years down the road, five years down the road and, and understanding what is this type of, you know, am I willing to pay a little bit higher interest rate so that I can uh, adjust my financial plan and, and start building the lifestyle that I want to have? That's a great point. So that's something that we talk about all the time, but I wasn't even considering when I was answering. People don't think about that. So they'll have a new job, take this cash and put it down on their house. Now they're at this new job for two years. They become friends with another physician who says, I'm gonna start a private practice. I've always had this dream. Do you want to buy in? Do you wanna be a part of this? And let's say the buy-in is $200,000 and they go, it's all tied into equity now, I'm stuck. I put all that money down here and now I don't have this ability to take advantage of this opportunity. So your mortgage, let's say it's six and a quarter percent, and you can park your cash in a market uh, money market account today and make 5%. So we're really talking about 1.25-ish, let's call it even worst case scenario, 2% 
is what you're losing by not putting that money down against the mortgage because you're making four and you're putting what 6% is your mortgage to give us an even number. Those numbers aren't perfect, but 2% is basically the cost in order to have cash available. So when an investment opportunity comes up, you actually have the dry powder to deploy and be a part of that. That private practice could return 30% and be the entire setup for the rest of your career. But over saving 2%, you took all that cash and put it down on your house. And now you're stuck with no cash available and no ability to enter this type of an investment. And that's really what the difference of that wealth and rich mindset is. You can take that lump sum of cash at any point and drop it onto that loan and get a big principal buy down and it'll reset and make it back to a 4% or losing that 2% difference. You cannot get that cash in a moment's notice to be a part of something else. And that's what drives me nuts is the rich mindset. It, it gets stuck in the tunnel vision and it doesn't focus on these greater thoughts where the wealth mindset says, man, is there a chance that I'm going to need a hundred grand cash in the next few years that may be not only a better investment, but could be a life-changing decision. And if I have this hundred grand cash, I can jump in and deploy it immediately. Do I see potential opportunities coming for that? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm going to then basically pay a 2% penalty for holding this money today versus putting it as a down payment because I think the benefits outweigh the downside. So I'm hedging my bet and saying, I'll pay 2% for the likelihood to do much better down the road. No, I think that's a great point. And even as you were saying that, uh, you were kind of compounding on my great points. So this is great. We're just making great points all, all day here. But I think the other thing I think about is you put all this cash down, you don't have a ton of cash then, and, and you've got this mortgage with a, with a better interest rate, you know, let's call it 6%. Uh, well, then if somebody does approach you with an opportunity like that, you're like, well, where am I going to get a hundred thousand dollars? Oh, well, I put all this money down on my house. Now I can just take out a home equity line of credit. Uh, to, and, and I'll just pull that money out and invest in my buddy's private practice. Well, now you're paying interest on a home equity line of credit that really takes away from other cash opportunities down the road that takes away from, I mean, what a lot of people call an emergency fund, uh, because now you don't have the money in savings and you don't have the money in a home equity line of credit. You're really running yourself thin for when that great opportunity does come up. And I, I think you would agree. We're not, we're not sitting here saying, Hey, you need to have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting on the sideline for the what if, but more often than not, if you have that type of money sitting there, more opportunities just kind of hit you, right? Like you're out there looking for opportunities, knowing that you want to deploy that money to get 20 or 30%. And, and, and you'll find those opportunities versus if you don't have that money sitting there, it's all stuck in the equity of your house. You're not looking for those opportunities, those potential big home run opportunities that come your way. You're just not looking for them because you just know, hey, I don't have the cash sitting on the sidelines to be able to do that. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, we're going to... We're going to go off on a tangent here, but I love it because that's exactly right. So the home equity line is great, but the reality is if somebody says, hey, you need a hundred grand, we're going to do this. Even if you get excited, you then think, well, now I got to go get a home equity line. Now I have to call the bank. Now they're going to have to do an appraisal. I don't know what my house is worth. And all these roadblocks start lining up and you just say, you know what? I just don't think it's going to work for me. I appreciate the offer. The other thing is like you said, this is just true reality. And everybody likes to talk about numbers and Excel sheets and calculators, and they remove emotion, but the human brain is way more emotion than it is logic. And the calculator is not always going to dictate our decisions. And that's a perfect example that you brought up. If you have $100,000 sitting in the bank and you know, I want to use this to make a great investment, your brain will be scanning for these great investments all the time. And when somebody is having conversation about an investment, you'll step up and have that conversation. And you'll be a part of this because you know that 100 grand is earmarked to be invested. So all of a sudden, these same opportunities were always around, but now you are always subconsciously paying attention and looking for these opportunities. Where if you don't have this 100,000, you don't have it earmarked, you say, if something falls in my lap, I'll get a home equity line. I'll do this. I'll do this so I can work things around. I'll borrow from my 401k. Yeah, there's a million ways we can do it on paper. But you're not going to be looking for those opportunities because this sounds like a lot of work. Your brain knows subconsciously this is a lot of work to actually get this money. So it's going to be talking about the sports games and it's going to be talking about the weather and it's going to be avoiding these conversations that equal more work. But if that money is sitting there ready to go, 
all of a sudden, it seems like magic. There's more opportunities that fall into your lap, but they don't. You're actually looking for them. And in the other route, you're not looking for them. So the only way for it to happen is if somebody hits you upside the head with an opportunity and then you go put in the work. So I think that's a huge point that people miss all the time. We're talking about 401ks and tax strategies and the emotion behind it carries a ton of weight. And if you park money aside and say, I'm looking for the absolute best investment, you're gonna find that investment much quicker than the guy over here who doesn't have any money earmarked for a great investment and says, I'm just gonna worry about whether the market went up today or the market went down and I'm gonna watch CNN news. They're never gonna find these deals. These deals feel like unicorns to them because they're just distracted and their brain's not looking for these different types of deals. So I think that carries just so much more weight than anybody would ever realize. And that is really, you know, I talk about the mindset all the time, but like the rich versus wealthy mindset, that's really what it boils down to is the wealthy mindset. It somehow always puts you in a position to be ready for opportunities like that. And you start to build that muscle and become better and better at it. Where all of a sudden you look back and it's like, man, I find all these opportunities. I don't know how anybody else doesn't find them, but that's why it is, is because you're specifically looking for those and you have the money earmarked for those type of investments. Love that. I, I'm glad we went on that tangent. You got all fired up and I, I love when you get all fired up about uh, strategy. Uh, it, it, it's the lifeblood of what we do. Uh, I mean, we talked about some good stuff today, man. Uh, we talked about physician home loans. Uh, we talked about traditional investing and some of those different, or traditional financing and, and some of the differences there. And then obviously we, we dove into the nitty gritty with, with interest rates and uh, down payments and, and things to think about. I think physicians will watch this and, and really get the motor turning. You know, there's going to be some that are, are thinking about buying a home soon, some that are in the process now where I, this is going to be a really beneficial episode for them. Uh, if they want to learn more, they can obviously reach out to us at grandvision.co. If you haven't already, Go check out the five day financial challenge. Uh, that's from an education standpoint, that's that's that next big step. And uh, I'm excited all the physicians that are going through it and, uh, you know, seeing the impact that that creates. But it all comes down to education. It all comes down to to the at bats. Right. You know, understanding what to look for and, and what to do next. Uh, it's a great opportunity for him. What are some final thoughts from you? Uh, final thoughts. So next steps, what to do. One thing I want to say is we recorded that uh, credit repair, credit reporting episode. So watch that in mm -hmm. conjunction with talking to banks. The one thing with that is when you make these meetings with these banks, do not have them pull your credit. Go to Credit Karma, go to annual credit report, whatever it is, find your score, and then just give them a hypothetical. Say, I'm not looking for a hard credit pull. But hypothetically, I have a 722 credit score or hypothetically, I have a 694 credit score. What does this program look like with that credit score? And have these conversations, have a financial statement that the bank can review, but do not have each individual bank pull your credit. Have these conversations first based on a hypothetical credit score that is actually you know, your credit score in general from Credit Karma, but have those conversations to find which bank you're actually gonna go forward with before there's a credit pull. That's for the physician loans. We're having these individual bank conversations. Physician loans, not always the best. So also talk to two different mortgage brokers. A broker has access to so many wholesale lenders that you've never even heard of. You don't even know they exist and they issue mortgages. The brokers have access to these people. And typically because these places don't have a retail location, they're gonna be more competitive than Wells Fargo and Chase Bank because they are just funding loans. It's basically a work from home lender call it. But talk to two mortgage brokers with that same hypothetical. I'm not giving you my social security number. We're not pulling my credit, but here's what I think my credit score is. Let's run a hypothetical. I wanna know what it would be FHA and Fannie or Freddie. What would be the best option for me? So you can compare both sides. You have a good number of data points to say this is definitely the best decision for me. The biggest thing as well is that will give you so much experience in actually having these conversations, learning the lingo, hop into the Facebook group and ask, hey, what does this mean? The banker said this, I didn't understand it. What does that mean? You start to learn the lingo and learn from these conversations and you're gonna have the best deal possible by doing that. The one other thing we didn't talk about is the nice thing of having a local lender is if you decide to go the investing route down the road, you already have opened that door to that lender. So if you wanna buy an eight unit apartment complex, you wanna buy an RV park, you wanna buy a storage facility, you wanna start your own private practice and you need lending, you already open that door and you have an email and a phone number. 
you have history with them, and it's gonna be a lot easier conversation. So that is one thing that I would say is a wealth first rich mindset as well. Rich mindset is always looking for the best deal today. Wealth mindset is looking for the most valuable deal overall. So if I'm looking at a broker over here who does an FHA loan for me, and it's gonna be a slightly better deal today, but I can have a relationship built with this bank that is gonna be very similar, but it's gonna open up doors in the future that I don't even know are coming yet. I'm going to lean to building this relationship because that's gonna carry more value long-term than focusing on just getting a 0.1% better rate today from this broker. It's more important overall for my wealth plan to make sure that I know this guy. And especially, this guy's gonna be connected to other people in the community. So all of a sudden when you say, hey, I'm looking to buy an eight unit apartment complex, that's my next move in my wealth plan, you can call this lender and say, hey, by the way, if you know anybody selling, if you know anybody struggling and you got a loan on your books that you want, just so you know, I'm looking for an eight unit apartment complex. And they might say, you know what, we don't, but the bank down the street, we just had a meeting, they got this portfolio that's fallen, you know, I'll let them know that we have somebody that's looking to buy. So these are types of things of the rich versus wealth mindset where the rich focus on just winning today, the wealth focus on winning for the long term. And that is one thing that I think you got to keep in mind is even if the deal is slightly better, sometimes the long term game plan is going to be the overall win. Now, if it's a quarter percent, a half percent, yeah, you may have to say, I have to do this for this loan. There is that break even, but don't always just focus on this broker said this lender will give me the absolute best percentage rate and that's where I'm going because you're not gonna live there for 30 years. So that calculator on how it works out great is not gonna be as beneficial as you think it is because you're gonna sell on statistics, you know, in seven to 10 years anyways. Absolutely. See, that's exactly why I always ask you for final thoughts because uh, you're gonna think of something that we didn't cover in the episode that, you know, we're 50 minutes in. I hope everyone's stuck with us this long, but uh, those were great insights, great analysis on, on just a nuanced thing that people don't think about. But when I say people, I mean kind of that rich mindset versus the wealthy mindset. The wealthy are always thinking about these things. What's the long-term play here? How can I uh, be more advantageous down the road uh, versus, hey, I'm just trying to close a loan in the next 60 days. You know, what's the lowest number that I can get with a percentage sign after it? So great insights uh, until we hang out again on another episode of Wealth Wednesday. Good seeing you, Mike. Thank you.